So I'm going to talk about Hadoop, a uh, thing that I've been working on most recently, uh, and which has been the subject of a lot of press, a lot of attention. I, I think a lot of people are, are rightly concerned that uh, there could be some hype around, uh, around Hadoop, that it's, it's maybe a little overblown. Um, I'm going to try to describe both what Hadoop is, as well as the trends that are driving it and the trends that it's following, uh, and hope to convince you um, that there's actually something here that I think is a, is a solid foundation, that it's a, it's a platform uh, that will be around uh, and that uh, it will make you comfortable um, uh, in adopting it, or at least uh, informed. Uh, in doing so. So first, uh, talking a bit about where Hadoop came from. Uh, you know, it, it's, there are these, I think, long-term trends uh, that, that it's really um, the result of. Um, it was, it was the, the, the right thing at the right time. It was, you know, it was sort of fortunate. Um, uh, on one hand, we've got, you know, Moore's Law and these, these hardware trends that have been delivering, you know, faster processors, more memory, bigger drives, um, you know, expansion across all these dimensions. Um, for 20, 30, 40 years, um, a, a very long time, which is phenomenal. If you step back and think about it, there's, there, I, I can think of no other technological trends um, that have seen that kind of exponential growth sustained for that, that length of time. And so it's not surprising that you sort of see some phase transitions now and then in, in the way these, these technologies are used. Um, so you know, as this has become more affordable, the, the hardware, uh, and more powerful, uh, we've seen it spread across industries. Um, and it's used in, you know, businesses you wouldn't have imagined that it was used in, you know, a few years ago. Like every tractor these days has a GPS and is recording its position as it goes around. Um, uh, people are putting sensors um, out in, in fields, um, measuring the, the sort of microclimates. It, it, it goes on. Um, there's, there's technology everywhere. And it's even become, I think, a, a primary driver of economic growth. Uh, the, the sectors of industry that are growing the fastest are the ones that are adopting technologies the fastest. Um, so uh, you've, you've got these trends of, of, of businesses using lots of uh, technology, which means that they're generating lots of data. Now, a lot of it may not be being saved today. It might be just flowing through. Um, but it's possible to save it. And it's affordable to save it, given that uh, processors and drives are so cheap, and it's affordable to analyze it. Um, so th this, this sort of confluence of conditions um, was what, what Hadoop was, was born into. Uh, it was you know, originally uh, to support a particular application, web search. Um, but people have found it useful in, in many other ways. So I, I got started down this road um, uh, trying to build a system called Nutch. We were trying to uh, reproduce uh, approximately what Google does or what uh, Microsoft does with being a, a web search engine, but entirely as open source. Uh, I'd previously had experience in open source through Lucene and, and liked very much working in, in that uh, methodology uh, and thought that web search would be a, a good thing to do there. Um, and we right away needed to have distributed technology because the web was bigger than we could store or process on, on one computer. Uh, and we spent a couple of years and we had something that was you know, kind of up and stumbling along. Uh, and we saw some papers from Google describing the way they were doing things. Uh, Google published a paper first about GFS, the Google file system, uh, then a paper uh, about their MapReduce processing framework building on top of GFS. Uh, and these were just obviously the right tools for us to be using in Nutch. Um, we were doing almost the exact same sorts of computations that you would do in MapReduce, uh, and, and including the shuffle and, and all the phases of it. We weren't calling it that, and it wasn't automated. It was very manual. Uh, and so it was easy to, well, it wasn't totally easy, but <laughs> it was easy to uh, imagine moving all of these things um, on top of a, a MapReduce engine. Uh, so we set about doing that. Uh, I was a, another fellow and I, Mike, Mike Caffarella. Um, took us a couple years, and we had something that now, you know, instead of being able to run uh, with a lot of manual uh, uh, intervention on maybe five machines, we could run something on 20 or 40 machines. But that was as many as we had access to. I was working at the Internet Archive, and uh, Mike was working at University of Washington. Uh, and at, at that point, Yahoo came along and said that their architecture for um, uh, distributed data computing that they were using in their web search uh, needed a, a, a rework. And they thought this work we're doing in Nutch looked really appropriate. Um, uh, and they had thousands of computers and could really make sure that it scaled and, and performed well um, uh, at scale. 
Uh, so I went to work for Yahoo for a few years. Um, and uh, they put a large team of developers on it. And um, by around, oh, I guess it was 2007, 2008, um, Yahoo was using uh, Hadoop to process uh, what was the entire web at that point, when, when Yahoo still had a web search engine. Um, and we'd, we'd taken the technology out of Nutch and, and christened it Hadoop. Um, so that's sort of the, where things came out of. Um, you know, there are these two primary components uh, inspired both by, the, by Google Papers. Uh, you've got HGFS, which is a distributed storage system. Uh, you, you take a lot of, lot of machines that are, you know, roughly similar to one another um, uh, with lots of hard drives attached to them. Uh, and you put them all together on a network and call it a file system, uh, more or less. It's, it's, uh, there's a little bit more to it, but, but not much. Um, and on top of that, you have a, a, a computing layer, the, the MapReduce, uh, which runs big batch computations over data sets that are um, living out in this, in this file system. And it does so by moving the computation to the data, uh, which you know, I think uh, Shai was talking about earlier, the importance of, of um, uh, localizing the, the, the computation as much as possible. Uh, and that's very much the, the spirit here. So what we got out of it was um, something that scaled much more affordably uh, than previous solutions. Um, it was distributed, and if it's distributed, it's gotta be reliable. Uh, the sort of those things go go hand in hand, um, uh, and it have offered a new style of, of of use as well that that was I think popularized here, which is rather than trying to or forcing people to um, figure out what their schema was up front, uh, and, and in a sense uh, think about what their queries were and what the problems they wanted to, were to solve before they loaded their data. Rather, we encourage a pattern where you load the data and then you figure out what you want to do with it. Uh, and, and you have this sort of more flexible architecture where you can experiment with it. Um, so there was not just the sort of technological elements, there were also some stylistic elements in, in Hadoop. So since then, um, uh, very rapidly, a bunch of other projects uh, grew up around Hadoop, built on top of it. So Hadoop sort of become a kernel for um, distributed computing. Uh, I think of it's, it's very much analogous to a, uh, an, an OS for distributed computing, where the kernel handles um, uh, you know, file systems and um, uh, resource contention around processors, access controls, things like that. And then we get all these other layers that are built on top. Um, we've got HBase, I'll talk a bit more about. Uh, there's an online key value store, a, a NoSQL score, store, as they're called. Um, Pig and Hive, which are scripting languages, um, which out of the, the back emit MapReduce jobs. Uh, Scoop, tool for moving uh, data from a relational database into um, uh, HGFS and back out. Um, uh, we've got Flume for um, uh, if you've got events, uh, say logs that you want to stream into HGFS or HBase um, uh, and do so reliably. Um, uh, so real-time streaming. Uzi, workflow manager, you've got, uh, you want to have certain uh, jobs and actions triggered by other things um, or on a regular basis, an hourly basis. Um, we're, if you want to deploy all this stuff in the cloud and Amazon, Rackspace, uh, or whatnot, it's a, it's a set of scripts and so on to, to manage that. Uh, Mahout, machine learning library, and, and so on. And there's getting to be, oh, I don't know, I, I've probably got 10 listed here, and there's probably 15 or 20 projects which are now generally bundled together into the, the Hadoop ecosystem. And they all share a, a pretty high degree of integration, which I, I think is really, it's really critical. So we started with this batch engine, MapReduce. It's a great tool. I mean, it's, it's, it's really, um, you know, if you, if you need to, to analyze all of a data set, uh, and perform some computation over it, uh, it's hard to beat. Um, uh, uh, you know, it gives, and, and it, the, um, uh, the ability to scale linearly um, is pretty um, unprecedented. There's not, there's not much else out there that, that can do that as well. Um, it is just batch computation. There's a lot of other things that people might want to do besides batch. And so it, it formed this nice um, base uh, for reuse, um, uh, you know, reused by Pig and Hive and so on. Um, but also, I think people pigeonhole Hadoop and say, well, it's, it's just a batch computing system. If you want to do other stuff, uh, you, need, you need a different system. Um, but you know, soon, we, we saw HBase get added. Uh, this is uh, an, inspired by another paper out of Google. Thanks, Google. Um, uh, the the Bigtable paper. Um, uh, and uh, HBase, as I said, is a, is a NoSQL store. So you've got, um, you can do puts and gets under, under keys, it's key value pairs. Um, and at a very high rate, and you see the results right as they happen. Um, so it's, it's definitely for sort of online computing. Um, uh, it's 
used, uh, for example, um, who's, a, who's a good example? Oh, well, F Facebook uses um, HBase for, for every message. So it's used by online, uh, by, by web systems, web-facing services um, uh, uh, frequently. Um, uh, but I think one of the things that helped HBase uh, help propel it um, uh, relative to other um, NoSQL stores uh, is that it's integrated with this Hadoop platform, uh, that it shares the storage that you are as much as possible co-locating things. And you're sharing things like um, uh, authentication and authorization and snapshots and disaster recovery and all these things as much as possible, um, uh, the operation of it is shared. Um, uh, and you also get some benefits where you can do a bulk load um, very effectively using MapReduce, or you can do a bulk analysis of an HBase table using MapReduce, um, because without, without necessarily having to move your data between two different systems. Um, so it's, it's a very popular combination. And I think it also indicates sort of the beginnings of where, where the platform is headed. Here we go. Uh, it shows us that big data isn't just batch computing. Um, uh, there's a lot of other, uh, I, I think, themes that are, that are the, the real uh, things behind this. Um, uh, scalability, I've mentioned several times. Um, uh, you know, in order to scale, uh, you need to be able to run on multiple computers. You need to be distributed. Once you're distributed, you know, you, the, the reliability becomes critical. You can't, you can't have one without the other. Um, if you've got uh, one computer and it fails once a year, that might be fine. Uh, but if you've got 1,000 computers, you're going to have them, some failing every day, um, uh, maybe more. Uh, you've got more network components involved as well. Uh, so you have to focus a lot on reliability. That's, that's where the magic in all this is. Um, building a simple platform that's simple to program, um, but that does so uh, reliably uh, and, and spreads the computation and the data over all these, these resources. Um, another element that's a, a part of scalability is, is affordability. Um, if you can do it on hardware that's a tenth the cost, then you can afford to, to have 10 times the data. Um, uh, it's, it, it, they really aren't different concepts. Um, uh, scalability and, and affordability. And similarly, the software needs to be affordable. And, and, and this is a case where open source uh, is, is wonderful. You know, the cost is effectively uh, zero, at least, at least to try it. Uh, some people may wanna, wanna get some uh, support later, um, but I think that it also sets the, the basic level um, uh, down quite low um, uh, for, for the software. Uh, also mentioned already the, the importance of this schema on read style. Um, uh, this notion of, of saving your data so that you can explore it. Um, and last, I want to mention this, this notion that having more data is oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes uh, better than having a, a smarter algorithm. Uh, you know, you can, it gives you, in effect, a, a higher resolution picture of your business, whatever that may be, if you're, if you're collecting data. And, and in that, you can see more things, especially in sort of long tail problems. Um, talk about this more in a minute. So, what is, if it's, what, what, where do we want big data to go? Uh, so I, I like to have this concept of the, the holy grail, what, what, what we like to see. Um, we obviously um, find open source to be uh, a critical component. Um, running on inexpensive hardware uh, is also a key. Um, we want things to scale. We want all the systems, all the algorithms to scale linearly as far as possible so that if you need to uh, double the size, you can double the hardware. You need to have the latency you can double the hardware. Um, uh, at least that's the ideal. Uh, there's also some other features which would be wonderful to have, which I think when we first set out down sort of the, the, the big data road, um, people didn't think were possible. They thought, oh, if you're doing NoSQL, well, you need to give up joins. Just not gonna, not gonna happen, uh, and that's, that's, that's where we're gonna, we're gonna be. Um, uh, and transactions um, across multiple tables and things like that are, are also probably impossible uh, in this world. Um, uh, but nonetheless, we, we might still like to have those. Um, and so I've listed in here as, as things we like to get there. And so how are we gonna figure out where we're going uh, and, and where we ought to go next? But fortunately, we've got these, these friends who live in the future, Google. Uh, Google has been doing this a little bit longer than the rest of the world, exploring this, this architectural space. Uh, and they send us these messages from the future via these, these publications. Uh, we saw, you know, in, in 2004, they published the GFS and MapReduce papers, and 2006, the Hadoop project was started. Um, 2005, um, they talked about Sawzall. 2008, we saw Pig and Hive. Um, 
2006, I guess, uh, Bigtable was published. And by 2008, uh, there was HBase uh, directly based on it. Uh, more recently, uh, there was a paper um, from, out of Google about a system called Dremel. Um, uh, someone ref referred to it earlier today, I believe, um, uh, for doing interactive SQL queries um, uh, as opposed to batch SQL queries that, that Hive can do. Uh, and in 2012, uh, Cloudera um, uh, launched Impala, an open source uh, SQL engine that, that uh, solves a lot of these problems. It can do um, uh, reasonably complex joins and give you interactive performance um, uh, in SQL. Uh, also last year, uh, I think it's some very exciting work. Um, Google talked about their, their work, a system called Spanner, where they showed how they can do transactions over a globally distributed database, which is it's just an, uh, it's something I think we all thought wasn't going to happen uh, anytime soon. And, and now we see it here. Um, so it, it really um, begins to look like we can have this holy grail. And, and you just think about, well, what is that system? Um, it's a system that scales arbitrarily and supports all the features we've known, um, plus has a very uh, general purpose platform that's very flexible. Um, it starts to look like a very attractive platform uh, um, for all kinds of, of computations. And I think we've got all kinds of problems that can benefit from this. As businesses collect more data and generate more data, um, uh, they, they can optimize their businesses, um, uh, find new businesses um, by taking advantage of this data. Um, so a classic paper about this um, by some uh, folks from Google, uh, Peter Norvig uh, notably gives a, a great um, talk on this about the unreasonable effectiveness of data. Encourage you to look on, on YouTube for that talk. Um, uh, where he talks about a number of cases where uh, trying multiple algorithms and training them on data sets um, versus just training a, a simple algorithm on a larger data set um, uh, works much better. Uh, gives you um, uh, better results um, and with far less um, uh, need to tweak things. And you've got something you can understand more easily. Um, it's just, if you can afford to do it, it's, a, it's in, in many cases a much better approach. Um, uh, another um, uh, interesting paper was a um, fellow from Walmart who was teaching a class at Stanford um, where he had students compete on a project uh, and um, uh, he calls it more data usually beats better algorithms. In this case he was talking about um, primarily not just the advantage of more data of the same type but of combining data sets of different types. He was, he was trying to solve this uh, movie prediction problem. If you know that somebody's like these movies, what movie will they like next? Um, and notice that the students who combine data from, say, IMDb, uh, so got, got other objective measures of movie quality um, with the, the predictions, um, then they achieve much better results. And again, this is something we see again and again, uh, that it's not just about having more data, it's having more data from different sources. Um, and we see in a lot of places, companies have uh, their data siloed in different parts of the company and aren't able to easily combine it. Um, and these kinds of systems can let you dump lots of different types of data together and begin to combine them in new ways and, and find, find new value. Um, so overall, I really think it's, it's important that uh, these kinds of platforms support exploration. We don't know upfront uh, all of the things we might want to do, um, but we need to save the data now um, or else we won't have it in the future to analyze. We, we see a lot of customers who are taking data sets off of tape and restoring them and putting them online, um, not because they always know what they want to do with them, but just because they can, and now they can start to analyze and look at long-term trends. So instead of looking at the last months of transactions, uh, this is, you know, for example, credit card companies looking for fraud, uh, they can now look at years of transactions and do one big analysis over, that, uh, over all that time. Uh, and uh, I, I, Hadoop is really growing to become a foundation uh, for this, this kinds of things. It's, um, it's becoming a very uh, general purpose uh, system that doesn't just support batch computation, but now interactive SQL. We recently uh, saw the launch of a solar running on Hadoop, uh, very well integrated. Again, we'll share all of the backups, all of the data, all of the indexes and everything are in HDFS. It's not a parallel system at all. It's very much an integrated thing. Same authentication, same authorization. Um, so you can do, you know, this previous speaker was talking about importance of snapshots across all of your data. 
that, that will work with this. Um, so I, it's becoming, uh, as I said, an, an OS uh, for, for big data. I want to close up with a little thought about how I've seen uh, how to get adopted. Um, uh, I think this pattern um, has occurred many times. Um, uh, I wasn't at Google when it started using GFS and MapReduce. Um, but I've inferred pretty much that this is more or less a pattern that Google saw. They had, they had a web search problem. Uh, they built some general purpose tools to help them uh, better build their web index. And over time, they found that those tools were, became a foundation for all sorts of things in products outside of web search. Um, and uh, you know, I suspect that uh, GFS and its uh, you know, you know, follow-on follow uh, file systems um, are now used much more widely outside of search than they are just, just in search at, at Google. Uh, same with Yahoo. Yahoo started down this road uh, trying to build a better search system. Uh, and now they don't even do search, yet they've got, I don't know, 10, 20,000 uh, nodes uh, run, running how to, maybe more than that nowadays, um, doing log analysis, doing all sorts of uh, predictions uh, for their business. We see it at, um, uh, as I mentioned, credit card companies, oil companies doing um, oil exploration, um, uh, it's, you know, agricultural companies. It's, it's across all industries. Folks are, are finding data sets uh, that they can improve their businesses uh, by, by better understanding. So they first find this big problem uh, that demands this approach, which they can't either afford to do any other way or they just can't get it to run any other way. They try it with Hadoop. They build a proof of concept. They find out it works. And they start to deploy it into production. And in the process, they start moving other data sets on. Other people in the, in the organization start saying, hey, can I try something on that data? Can I load my data set? And pretty soon, it starts snowballing. Um, and so it's really getting over that first hump, finding a, a business need where you can really demonstrate the value um, of building a cluster uh, like this. And then after that, year over year, we, we see everyone continue to grow uh, their, their adoption of these technologies. Um, uh, it's, it's pretty exciting to see. Um, so, you know, not that many years ago, uh, there were just a couple of us working on Hadoop. Um, uh, now, it's, uh, there's, there's thousands of folks using it. Um, uh, and I encourage you, if you're not already um, uh, using this, to think about where it might be appropriate. Um, think about data that you have that you're um, ignoring, that's, you know, slipping through your fingers, uh, and that you might be able to save and, and benefit from. And, um, better see and understand um, uh, what you're doing. Um, uh, another thing is to think about the, the context of that information. Um, Yahoo doesn't just save uh, the simple sort of uh, log line for each um, uh, page view. It includes, uh, uh, it logs every single link uh, and graphic on the page uh, that wasn't clicked on, as well as the one that was clicked on, so that they can, in effect, reconstruct the page and figure out what someone might have read and, and passed over before they clicked on something and do a much more thorough analysis. And they can afford to do this. It's inexpensive to store all that. Um, similarly, I know retailers who were looking at not just recording all of the products that are sold, but where they were shelved on the store uh, uh, when, when someone picked them up and, and looking at that data and see if they can optimize the, the, the layouts of stores. And you can imagine there's a lot of, lot of more cases where it might be easy to grab some context about the data that you're storing and, and add that as well and might, might have great value. So anyway, um, also think about uh, data sets that you might, uh, that, that people you know and work with might have that might complement your data set uh, and, uh, and, and give you uh, insights uh, that you, you haven't imagined yet. So that's all I uh, had for you today. Um, thank you very much for having me. <laughs>